Again, I want to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us. And my name is Terry Knight. Uh, for 17 years, I hosted a daily radio show called Garden Bite with Terry Knight, Nibbles of Knowledge on All Things in the Garden. My podcasts are on all the platforms, and you can also find me on the National Garden Bureau website. You can reach me at gardenbite.com and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. And again, we're so excited to see you all. We're so excited to listen to these four amazing authors. Again, I'll remind you one more time to please put your Zoom on speaker view, turn your video off as it does help with our bandwidth, and remember to post your questions in Q&A. Well, folks, let's get started. This is exciting. I now want to introduce our GardenCom representative, Shelly Cram. Shelly, join us. Thank you, Terry. And once again, welcome to our GardenCom Arthur's Talk About Gardening Party. This is our biggest party yet. So we're so glad you're joining us tonight. It's going to be great gardening fun. As she said, my name is Shelly Cram. I've been director for Garden Communicators International, commonly referred to as GardenCom. GardenCom is proud to partner with the National Gardening Bureau and introduce you to some amazing garden writers who belong to both of our organizations. GardenCom members are professionals in the green industry world, but we speak to home gardeners and to all those in the green industry trade through a variety of mediums such as photography, speaking, podcasting, and such radio, TV, you name it. Wherever we can talk about gardening, that's what we love to do. So now I'd like to turn it over again to our co-sponsor, Diane Blazik with the National Garden Bureau. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Yes, this is, I think, our largest Garden Come Authors Talk gardening party to date. I'm the executive director for National Garden Bureau and All America Selections, and it is very exciting uh, to be here. This is our fifth one. I think we counted up, so that's wonderful. Each one continues to get better. Our organization is 104 years old, believe it or not. We were founded in 1920. And what we do is put on programs like this so that we can inspire, motivate, and educate home gardeners. So hopefully that's where you fall in, is you wanna be here to be inspired. And we also have some other webinars we do, um, and we have our Year of program, new plants, things like that. So that's who we are. But now I am going to toss it back to Terry, and she can introduce our authors. Well, this is exciting. I do invite all four authors to introduce themselves, and we're going to start with Lorraine Johnson. Thanks so much for the invitation to be a part of this event tonight. Um, I'm Lorraine Johnson and I live in Toronto, uh, Canada. So on the shores of Lake Ontario uh, in Treaty 13 territory. Uh, I'm a long time native plant gardener. Um, I've garden here at home with a backyard woodland garden and a front yard meadow garden. But I'm also involved in a lot of community projects around food growing and uh, pollinator gardening. And I write books. Um, the most recent one is A Northern Gardener's Guide to Native Plants and Pollinators. All right. Thank you, Lorraine. And uh, Jenny Rose, Carrie, please introduce yourself. Oh, well, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm an English American gardener who now gardens in the southeast part of Pennsylvania. And I am an author and a photographer and a writer. And I am delighted to be here. So thank you for having me, Terry. Thank you very much. And Jeff Rugg, please introduce yourself. Thank you for having me, Terry. I started liking plants and animals and nature was a kid. My mom had lots of plants and we went camping as a family. I eventually got degrees in zoology, horticulture, and landscape architecture. I became an internationally certified arborist, Illinois certified nursery professional, a bunch of other things. I started writing a weekly syndicated newspaper column on gardening about 33 years ago, and it was the question and answer columnist for Chicagoland Gardening Magazine, uh, University of Illinois horticulture extension agent, teaching the master gardener and master naturalist programs, 
So I've been involved in this industry, in this area of horticulture for a very long time. I guess you have. Thank you, Jeff. And I would also like to invite this year's American Horticultural Society's Book Award winner, Noelle Johnson. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. I am a California native who uh, moved to central Arizona 37 years ago and killed everything I tried to plant <laughs> and was determined to figure out how to get beautiful things to grow in the desert, which you can. Uh, I have a degree in horticulture um, from Arizona State University, so I'm a desert horticulturist, and I am a columnist for Phoenix Home and Garden Magazine. I speak a lot. I teach a lot of classes, all to help people who are in the same situation as I was, who want to grow and have a beautiful outdoor space. So I do that through landscape consulting, um, as I mentioned before, speaking, classes, um, writing, however I can get the message out. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you all for being here. Uh, let's get to know the author personalities. The first question is, what compelled or inspired you to write this book? And I want to start with Noelle. One of the reasons I killed everything <laughs> when I first moved here was a lack of information that was pertinent to living in the desert or in a dry climate. Most traditional garden media ignores us. Um, you're not gonna find that many books on, on gardening and dry climates. Uh, magazines tend to skip us over. And you know, 20% of our country's population lives in a dry area. And I knew there was a hole in, in, in um, the literature. So I decided to write a book about it. <laughs> well, we're so glad you did. Uh, next, th or this question again now to Jenny. Well, I've always loved flowers, so this was the result of always loving flowers. And yeah. like Noel, I really felt like, especially during the pandemic, many people uh turned to vegetable gardening, and that seemed to be like a, a thing. But then, uh, as a garden historian, I realized that after vegetable gardening, most people then want to grow a few flowers, whether it's just for pollinators or, or not just because, you know, that's not a just, but for pollinators, for cutting, for fragrance, all of those things. So really it was, uh, again, I'm a lifelong educator, so it was a way of sharing. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Jeff, what compelled or inspired you to write this book? Well, over the decades, I've talked to a lot of people who owned a landscape that never took a horticulture class, who wanted to take the Master Gardener program, but they couldn't take off every Tuesday for 13 weeks, whatever the semester was. So I saw a need for the book that starts out so basic that the first thing it covers is what is a plant. And by the time you finish reading the book, you'll be able to take care of any plant indoors or out. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And Lorraine. What compelled or inspired you to write this book? Well, I really wanted to spread some love for insects um, and help people create kind of gardens that support the pollinators that support all life on earth as we know it. So the, the bees, the butterflies, the moths and other creatures. So I teamed up with a conservation scientist, Dr. Sheila Cola. And we, we set out to write a book that was very much grounded in the science of plant pollinator interactions, because, you know, this is um, kind of something that uh, is a sort of science that uh, isn't well known. So we wanted to share that, but in a really accessible way with lots of how to information to inspire people um, and help educate around how to support pollinators. All right, thank you so much. Now, moving to the next, uh, second question, which zone region do you garden in and what are you planning to do next in your garden? This time we'll start with Jenny. Well, I am right on the edge between a zone six and a zone seven. So it, you might know that recently the USDA changed the zone maps. If you haven't looked recently, put in your zip code on the USDA website and have a look and see where you are. But I'm technically a seven, but I live on just slightly on the top of a hill. So I don't think I've changed really. I think I'm still uh, in zone six, but that gives you an idea of what I can grow. And it's really a, 
very forgiving area around uh, Philadelphia. It's known for its horticulture. Um, you might have seen the America's Garden Capital website. So there's lots of gardens here to come visit. And I am next planning a newspaper wall. And you might say, well, what is that? If you Google it, normally it comes up with how to paste wallpaper on the, as you know, on the wall made of newspaper. But it's not. I make cubes of newspapers because uh, I like to read a physical paper and I tie them up with jute or biodegradable string and treat them like little bricks. And I, it's part of a rain garden. So I dig out the soil, make the bricks, pile them up a couple of things and then put the soil over the top of it. And so I have a ditch and this sort of berm at the back to stop the rainwater coming out. So it's a sort of rain garden, really. Very interesting. Thank you, Jenny. Jeff, which zone region do you garden in and what are you planning to do next in your garden? Well, I'm in zone four to five uh, in the Midwest and I've spent a lot of time in other regions. So I know a lot about a lot of different places, but my outdoor garden is getting pretty well set. I've grafted a few apple trees and I'm waiting for them to start bearing fruit. Indoors, I recently posted four videos on turning old aquariums into terrariums, and I have plans for another one that I'm going to be starting pretty soon. So I've got about 50 different species of indoor plants, and I need to you know, do some thinning and playing around with those right now. That sounds fun. Thank you, Jeff. Lorraine, quest same question to you. Well, in Canada, we have a different zone hardiness map, so I'm kind of in zone five six but the interesting thing about native plant gardening is that we sort of don't think so much in terms of zones but think about the ecological region we're in so um, I'm in the Great Lakes bioregion and a lot of the plants are similar to those you would find in the northeastern U.S. or even the upper midwest um, as for what I plan to do next in the garden I really want to do a lot more propagation this year and giving away of plants I find that pawpaw trees in particular, which are super easy to propagate from seed. Um, they're, they're great plants to draw people into the whole wonderful world of native plants because they have this fabulous large fruit. So I plan to do a lot more uh, uh, plant giving away so that neighbors can be growing plants and we can create a connected ribbon of habitat for pollinators in the area. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Lorraine. And the uh, next, or excuse me, uh, Noel, which region or zone do you garden in and what are you planning to do next in your garden? So I am in zone 9B. I was 9A. We are 9B now. And I live in a very diverse desert. It's a low desert. Uh, we have two distinct rainy seasons in the winter and the summer. So that allows a lot of biodiversity. I'm in the place where all the swarrows grow. I mean, I've got them down the street. Uh, I have them when I'm driving um, to, to meet clients. It's just beautiful. And my project has to do with reducing heat <laughs> in the summer. And a lot of people in this area have have concrete block walls. We have fences, but they're usually walls that absorb heat and they re-radiate it out in the summer, which isn't so nice. So I and my husband have been making these beautiful wood screens that we have painted a really beautiful um, colors because we do like to paint things here in the Southwest. And they're going to be placed along the walls behind a lot of my cacti and flowering shrubs. Wow, sounds exciting. Thank you, Noelle. Um, I do want to remind uh, our folks to please, as you join in, put your Zoom on speaker view, if you would. And now it's really exciting. It's time for our first raffle. This is for Jeff's book, Greener View Gardening. Diane? Yes, thank you. Um, so now I get to um, pull a name out of the hat, so to speak. And the first person that I have drawn is Barbara Soper. And Barbara, you're going to be the one that will get Jeff's book. So do me a favor, go down to the chat and private message me your mailing address. And then I will get that to Jeff and Jeff will get a book sent out to you. But congratulations, Barbara Soper. Yay, congratulations. 
And moving on to our third question, who is the intended audience for your book? And this time we will start with Jeff. Well, anyone who wants to know more about plants, but especially people who own a landscape and don't have any training, anyone who can't afford to take the Master Gardener program, uh, the new houseplant parents from the pandemic, uh, th this book with the Greener View YouTube channel work together because the playlists on the YouTube channel match the chapters in the book. So by t combining them together, you can learn a lot more, it, not just reading about something, but then seeing me you know, do the pruning or whatever it is that the video is about. So using the two together helps a lot to just anybody who likes plants will like the book and the videos. All right. Thanks, Jeff. That sounds great. Lorraine, who is the intended audience for your book? I like to think that the book is for everyone. So from the beginning gardener who's just starting out to the really experienced gardener, including really experienced native plant gardeners. Um, uh, but it's also, it's it's a book that's for, not just for people with backyards and front yards and access to space, but also we talk a lot in the book about gardening with native plants and creating pollinator habitat on balconies and in containers. And we really encourage people to get involved with um, community projects and see opportunities in public spaces to start planting uh, for pollinators. Um, and it's also, it's also a book, I think, for people who are experiencing some eco-anxiety and kind of feeling like, what can I do about these big global problems like climate change and biodiversity loss? And what this book talks about is, well, you can make a difference by uh, supporting biodiversity, planting native plants for pollinators, and really contributing um, in a positive way to some of the biggest problems out there. All right. Thank you, Lorraine. That's it's very imperative at this point. Noelle, uh, who is the intended audience for your book? The audience is for people who live in a low water region. Uh, what we would say is a, a drier climate, one that has lower humidity levels. So it covers the Mediterranean parts of our country, you know, California, where I grew up, and also covers the deserts as well. So um, water scarcity is a big deal. Our water resources are shrinking and we want to know how to garden successfully and have a beautiful garden um, without wasting water. But it also um, is for dry climates throughout the, the world <laughs> as well. So um, people in Australia and the warmer parts of Europe as well. And it's it's there to show them the way forward and how to make the most and have a beautiful a beautiful space without needing a whole lot of water. Very important, very important. Thank you, Noel. And Jenny, who is your intended audience? Well, I really think I wrote it for anyone that wants to grow more flowers, and really that's the sub that should have been the subtitle of my book. I think is grow more flowers, but. Um, I, for all the reasons that we keep talking about uh, flowers in, and them enriching our lives and adding beauty and things like that, um, I really feel like I wanted to pass on some of that. And the way I write is for people that want a plant packed uh, flower bed. So I'm not a proponent of bare soil. You know, I have gravel gardens and I use the gravel as a negative positive space. Um, but for most of my gardening, I grew up in England, so I um, like that cottage garden style look. So it's really very packed in. And that's also, uh, Lorraine, you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I have found that that makes it really buzzing with pollinators and life because they love that sort of intermingled uh, look. So it's intermingled, plant packed. Anyone who wants that and it has little recipe cards in there, it, it's like a photograph and, you know, a few words and that sort of thing. So hopefully people will be able to grow more flowers. I'm sure they will. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. And for the fourth question, tell us about one interesting thing, one interesting thing you learned while writing this book. And this time we will start with Lorraine. Well, writing this book was a really deep dive into the specialist relationships between native plants and insects. So I learned so much 
Um, so, you know, kind of jumping off from like the relationship between monarchs and milkweeds to learn that like 90% of the insects that eat plants actually have this kind of specialist relationship. So they depend on the native plants. They can't just eat anything. So one of the most interesting things I learned about was the ways that bees self-medicate at native plants where they get medicine for common um, parasites that bees have. So to think about our gardens that our native plant gardens can be pharmacies for pollinators, that just was an amazing uh, thing to learn. And learning about pollen specialist bees, and again, not just any plant can give them what they need. That was, that was, um, that was a new thing for me. That's pretty amazing. Thank you, Lorraine. Now, Noelle. Tell us one interesting thing you learned. Um, that writing a book is is a lot of work <laughs> and you have to rely on your publisher and that they know best. And um, they wanted, you know, cover photos, a big deal for your book. And so that was the first thing I was tasked to do. And I sent them lots of beautiful pictures of books of, of a lot of beautiful cover photo potential. They wanted a building in the background, like a house and lots and lots of plants. And my publisher's in Massachusetts. I'm in Arizona and the aesthetic's a little bit different here. We do have negative space in between plants. It's kind of something we're known for. I mean, Jenny's nodding, she's been here. Yeah. So I um, submitted lots of photos and they didn't like any of them. So I was a little, little overwhelmed and I, I took my um, good friend, Shauna Coronado, who also has written a lot of garden books. I said, I need your help. Help me. I need help with the, getting a cover photo. So we went to the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix and because they had some buildings there that looked like they could be houses. And we took a whole lot of pictures and we even kind of bypassed a gate. She just hopped right over and said, come on, let's go over here. Let's take a picture. This looks good. So I did. And just as we were leaving the garden, we took a picture just on our way out of the gift shop. That was the one they chose. So that's not a house. That's the gift shop at the Desert Botanical Gardens. And that's the one that they loved. And it's a botanical garden, so there's no very little negative space between anything. Um, and not surprisingly, the book's on like very prominent display at the garden because it's got their gift shop on the front. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Noel. Jenny. Oh, I love I love that story. Oh my goodness! Now, next time I go back there, I'm going to look and take the book and yeah, I can't <laughs> wait to get it. And another shout out to Noelle for winning the American Horticulture Society Award for her book. I am just I can't wait to get a copy. But all go and buy one. All of our books. I, I'm just doing a shout out, but particularly to Noelle on that one for winning the award. Okay, what was I talking about? I was telling you about one interesting thing. So the I think the thing that um, I take my own photos and a lot of them um, were taken right here in my garden here at Northview. And um, we have to to get the photos, the 650 in the book, believe it or not. And so uh, we blew them up on the big screen that I have for lectures and every other one or whatever had um, Noel will like this, too. Uh, Lorraine will like this too. The the little uh, my little friends I started calling, them, but you know half of them I have no idea what they are. But I know I'm very biodiverse because I never spray anything. So that was the most fun thing because you know just going through the photos and seeing all these these, these different insects, I just loved it. So I'm really obsessed now, Lorraine. So <laughs> all right, thank you, Jenny. Jeff, now the question to you. I think the fun thing that I learned is that uh, plants can't read. And we, we, make, we make books out of plants, but the plants themselves can't read. And so they're breaking the rules all the time. We've got a new hardiness zone map. The plants don't care. They've been growing where they're growing for 100 years. They're not, they don't care what the map says. They The rules say that if you build a house in the woods and you dig a trench for the septic system and for the gas line and the electric line that you're cutting a bunch of tree roots and all those big oak trees are going to die. And then 50 years later, there's a record cold winter or something and they die. And now we blame it on the cold instead of the damage that we caused 50 years earlier that it, the plant has had fungus in it for 50 years, slowly eating it away and rotting it out. So it's, it's interesting that 
you know, the, if the plants would just follow our rules and read the book, then they would die when they're supposed to, and we wouldn't do those bad things to the plants anymore because they would follow the rules. <laughs> well, rules made to be broken, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Jeff. And now on to our fifth question. When you give talks, what is the most common question you get and how do you answer it? Noel, we'll start with you. Not surprisingly, it is how often to water your plants. And it's a real issue here because most people think we're in the desert, more water is a good thing. But most people water too often and they're overwatering their plants and they don't water deeply enough to allow for deep root growth, which is best for plants. And um, as a result, their plants don't look good. They're, they're straggly, they're not flowering. And more plants that I see when I consult with clients are having issues with overwatering rather than underwatering. So we'll see nutrient deficiencies and things like that. So it's one of the most rewarding things I tell them is, you know what, you, you're just watering too much. Less is best, less frequently, and water for a longer length of time and allow them to go deep. And there's a lot of variables involved. You know, Jeff's talking about how plants don't always follow the rules and variables, you know, to talk about them due to sun exposure. Full sun, you're going to need more water than those in shade. Um, what's your water pressure like? Because most things here are irrigated. So there's a lot of different variables, but it's really fun to help guide people through that process. That's great information. Thank you, Noel. Jenny, that same question to you. So actually just playing off for a second off what Noel said, one of the things that I always say is I have a dry garden that I haven't watered for 20 years and I have more water than you do, but um, I'm a big proponent of really letting things struggle for a while and then they do grow deeper roots, but that's a whole nother conversation. So um, <laughs> I think probably... People ask me about seasonal gardening the most, um, partly because I am a very seasonal gardener. I have snowdrops and crocuses out now, and my whole year I have something in bloom, apart from if we have a big snowstorm and then I can't see my snowdrops or whatever. So how do you get a very hardworking flower bed that starts with things in you know late winter and then carries on through late fall? And to me, that is part of the lovely um, like four dimensional jigsaw puzzle. But in the book, I have a whole chapter on seasons with suggested plants for each um, season. And I don't do winter, spring, summer, fall. I do late winter into mid spring, late spring into summer, high summer, and then late uh, summer into fall. And those for me really each have a very distinct um, plant palette of flowers. So seasonal gardening would have to be it. I can understand that, certainly. Thank you, Jenny. And now to you, Jeff, what's your most asked question? I think I get asked a lot of what plant should I plant? People want recommendations and you know, I write the newspaper column all over the country. And so there, I get people from asking that question all over the country. And really, it really boils down to what's your environment? What is the plant going to be growing? The the plant is never going to be able to walk away from the soil that you put it in. And there's going to be drainage problems. There's going to be sunshine conditions. So you want to get the right plant for the right growing conditions. And if you do that, then it'll be healthier and easier to take care of. So I agree with uh, Jenny and Lorraine and, and Noel that the, if you put the right plant in the right place, you're going to be much happier as a gardener. Yeah, master gardener mantra, right plant, right place. Thank you, Jeff. And finally to you, Lorraine. I love hearing Jenny's enthusiasm for all of the uh, the creatures buzzing around her plants because a very common question that I get is why would I want to attract insects to my garden? Aren't they going to eat everything? Aren't they going to damage everything? And then another very common question 
is aren't native plants weeds? So there's a lot of fear out there actually around insects and around native plants. Um, but when you delve deeper and say, okay, what are these weeds you're talking about? It often turns out that they're non-native plants. They're introduced plants like dandelions or creeping Charlie or Queen Anne's lace. So there's quite a disconnect um, between a kind of the public perception of what native plants are and what those plants actually are. And so there's an opportunity to spread a lot of love for the native plants and the insects. All right. Thank you, Lorraine. And now for our second raffle for Jenny's book, The Ultimate Flower Gardener's Guide. Diane? Yes, I get to draw the second one. So the second name out of the hat is Connie Payton. And Connie, congratulations on winning Jenny's book. So same thing, yes, let's give a round of applause. Um, same thing, if you can direct message me in the chat with your mailing address, then I will keep track of that. I'll send it to Jenny after tonight's webinar and you will receive your free book. Congratulations. All right, woohoo, congrats, congratulations. Now moving to our sixth question, what plant or product do you recommend every gardener try? And we're going to start with Jenny. Well, it's interesting because it's very hard. Um, like uh, I think Jeff was talking about when you get asked for one thing and often it's right what's on my desk in my vase or like right in front of me, top of the mind. But this time I'm going to go more general and one of my big things, and I know other uh, authors uh, on the on the thing uh, party say the same thing, but I really encourage people to find something that brings them immense joy. And um, that often turns out to be a memory plant from when they were young. And maybe it was something with your grandmother or your next door neighbor or something like that. You might not have thought about it for ages, but you're like, Remember that lovely yellow daylily that my neighbor had that peeked over the fence or something? And that is the one that you should definitely get back. And if you're, that neighbor still exists, go and ask for a bit of it, you know, but a memory plant, I would say. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Jenny. And now to Jeff, what plant or product do you recommend every gardener try? I, I think everybody should try a new plant, especially vegetable gardeners. Vegetable gardeners tend to get into the rut of putting in tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers, and maybe one or two melons or something, but they really need to try something different. Your family will enjoy fresh vegetables that they've never had before, and, you know, to go through the garden catalog and just, you know, as a group, as a family, say, hey, we should try artichokes or something that sounds very interesting and just try that. That may become your new favorite vegetable that you can't do without. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And now the same question to Lorraine. Well, we've got memory plants and we've got new plants. And uh, I would say that wherever you are in North America, some of the I always recommend that some of the best plants uh, for pollinators and a great way to start out in this world of native plants is to plant um, some goldenrod, uh, asters, and sunflowers. And these are the native plants that support the greatest number of pollen specialist bees. So those bees that depend on the pollen of certain specific native plants. And they support the highest number of um, Lepidoptera, Lepidoptera, so the, the moth caterpillars, the butterfly caterpillars. So um, there are goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers um, within that gen those genera that um, will work in whatever conditions you have. And the, there are native plants in those genera across North America. And it's really important to stress that goldenrod does not cause hay fever. I know there's a lot of fear out there about it. And also a lot of the goldenrods are not rapid or exuberant spreaders. So there's a lot of choice. All right. Thanks, Lorraine. I love my asters. Uh, the same question to Noelle. Uh, two favorite tools, um, a shovel in your hands um, for taking out plants that no longer bring you joy. 
it is okay to pull out plants. And a lot of people have a problem with that. They feel guilty. They feel bad. They feel like they're hurting the plant. But it's important to think about the plants around your home, the ones that are beneficial to the environment, like Lorraine talks about. We want pollinator plants. We want to foster that. But if you have a plant that either has outgrown its um, attractiveness, that has disease or pest problems consistently, um, is getting too hard to manage, or maybe you moved into a home and you don't like the plants that are there. This is a very personal expression, your outdoor space, and it should bring you joy. And so I am just giving people permission to dig up a plant they don't like or pull it out. Thank you, because I can use that too. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate that. Now, our seventh question, what is uh, one gardening takeaway folks will learn from your book? We'll start with Jeff. I think the biggest thing is that the natural world is wonderfully created and you can learn a lot about how to take care of plant, the, taking care of plants with just a little understanding about how they grow. Uh, for instance, the terminal bud on the end of a branch is releasing little hormones, chemicals that cause the dormancy of the other buds. So in nature, if a deer eats that terminal bud off the, the tip of the branch, the other buds along the branch are released from dormancy and begin to grow. The deer gets more food, the plant gets more leaves, and everything works out well. So if you take that little bit of knowledge and know that when you prune that tip of that branch off, that you're releasing other buds from their dormancy, and that you're going to get more branches, you have that knowledge that you can now say, okay, I don't want those, how can I prune to, so I don't get those? Or I do want the plant to be denser, how can I prune it so I can get the plant to be denser? So the natural world is really well designed. And, and so if you follow the rules of, of the way it's created, you're going to have a much easier time taking care of your landscape. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Lorraine, what is the one gardening takeaway folks will learn from your book? Well, like Jeff's talking about really the amazing world of nature that we're a part of. And really, I think the I think one of the main things that people will take away from the book is the incredible um, relationships that have co-evolved between plants and insects, between native plants and insects. Um, and I think another thing is just the small tweaks that we can make in our gardens to really bump up the pollinator value of these habitats just hugely, like leaving the leaves where they fall or leaving the plant stalks and letting the new green growth come up around it. Um, the Adding dead wood, logs, nurse logs to the garden, these are incredibly valuable to pollinators and so simple to do and we can design with them. And we all have agency and power and I love what uh, both Noel and um, and Jenny mentioned around the joy. There can be joy in this work of healing the planet and supporting pollinators in the landscapes we steward. So that's that's the message I hope people take away from the book. That's a great message. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, Noel, how about you? Um, gardening in the desert is really different from other climates. And it, it can be overwhelming and stressful, even when I'm talking to experienced gardeners from other places. Uh, it's so different here that you can be a little bit lost. So the one thing, um, takeaway that I love to share with people is when you look at a plant label and you're looking at the uh, ideal time to plant it, or you're looking at the ideal sun exposure, full sun does not mean it can handle full sun in the desert necessarily. Sun here is a whole other beast in the summer and it's incredibly intense. And so um, we need to take advantage, no matter where you are, take advantage of local resources available to you. Um, look at your botanical garden, look at your cooperative extension office for resources, uh, master gardeners as to what plants are gonna do well and use your eyes. Observe what plants are doing well in a really hot location in my case and thriving. If you don't know what it is, take a picture of it and take it to your local nursery. They're going to be happy to identify it for you. But full sun doesn't necessarily mean desert sun. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Noelle. And Jenny, finally to you, what one gardening takeaway folks will learn from your book? I always feel like some inspiration because I I feel like you you need to ha set your brain going and and get your ideas. I mean, I am not uh, giving you any plans of how to put together a flower garden. I'm giving you the recipe and the ideas and what might work, and then the rest is up to you. Because I am a big proponent of a personal flower garden. You might see a lot of pink. You know, I, I tend to be wearing pinky purple and, you know, I'm, I'm into pink, uh, my pink pencil, my pink clipboard, you know. But um, so I'm not pushing you to have a pink garden like me, but I want you to really just please yourself and the whole idea of a personalized garden and having a go. I think that's that's the other thing, you know, like um, I often say, you know, if you're planting 10 zinnia seeds and you get five zinnias out of it. You've got five more than you had before you started. So it's not a bad thing. It's not a failure. You know, it's five nice zinnias that you can cut flowers from. So it's really like that inspiration, have a go, that sort of thing. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. And our final question before the breakout rooms, and I think everybody wants to hear this. Tell us about your biggest garden goof and what you learned from it. We'll start with Lorraine. This is the most embarrassing admission because when I first started gardening, uh, I decided to start some seeds of morning glory. So this was many, many years ago. They sprouted and I, for some reason, got convinced because this that first bit of the sprouting, it looked like roots. So I actually figured they were growing upside down, replanted them, in fact, upside down. So it's very embarrassing. Uh, it's the kind of mistake that you only make once. Uh, and what I learned from it really is uh, you, you, pretty much what Jeff said about plants don't read books, but they know what to do. So I learned to listen to plants and um, trust in them, have patience, and to sort of see my role as actually like creating the conditions that the plants need in order to thrive. All right. Thank you. I did that once with bulbs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and now to Noel, what was your gap? I would say, um, well, I know what it is. It's when I first moved here back in the eighties and we bought a house. I was excited to add new plants. I was not a gardener yet. And uh, everything I planted died. But I had checked the USDA zones, which deal with the minimum cold temperature, and they were well within what they should have been. But what I did not account for was heat. And if you live in a hot area or an area that gets really hot summers, you have to bring that into the equation. Can they handle intense heat? USDA zones are not enough um, if you live in a hot climate. So if you live in the South, Southeast, um, the Southwest, um, other regions, Heat can also be a factor that we need to to figure in in, in what we're going to be. That adding. is a very good point. Yes. Thank you, Noelle. And Jenny, how about you? Um, I think I'm going to go with design. I mean, there's so many to choose from on goofs. And, I'm, and I think that's the other thing to realize is so much of gardening is trial and error. And there's a lot of error in there. And anyone always makes mistakes. So I had a lovely gardening friend who came to my garden. This is many years ago. And bear in mind, I grew up in a cottage garden and we didn't really buy things from garden centers much. There wasn't a garden center. So you actually mostly got a parcel on plant. You've got one. So when I was gardening here, I have four and a half acres. This is not a cottage garden. And um, so I went and bought one thing. And so my lovely friend Betty came over and she said, Jenny, do you never buy more than one of every plant? And I'm like, no, why would I? And she was like, well, there's no real design here. You know, it's like a one, a one, a one. So I think my biggest goof is, you know, like learning that you have to put repeated things into a flower bed uh, and repeat by color or something like that, but um, or propagate them and then dig them up and divide them, but or grow from seed where you get a whole packet load. So I think that was that would be it, Terry. 
<laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Jenny. I think we've all done that. And uh, finally, to you, Jeff, what was your biggest garden goof? Well, I've been at this so long that I don't make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> what I make is our experiences. So I buy a plant, I come home, I forget that it's in the trunk, and two days later, I remember that it's there. I pull it out. It's completely wilted and dried out. And so I find a bucket of water, I fill the bucket up and I put the plant in there. I put it in the shade behind the garage so that it can recover. And a week or two later, I remember that there's a plant back there. And I go and I find the big smelly mess. And as I'm taking the plant to the compost pile, I complain about how hard it is to grow this plant. So <laughs> I have lots of experiences like that where I, I learn from the experiences and I don't treat them as mistakes. I just treat them as a little bit more additional knowledge for my gardening experiences. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. And we all have failures. Otherwise, we wouldn't garden. So uh, it's just try, try again. Well, we are uh, going to be going into the 20-minute breakout session. And folks, I want you to understand you have your choice of rooms among the four authors. After the breakout rooms, we still have another two books to give away, but you must be present to win, so don't go away. Once we are finished in the breakout rooms, everybody will come back to the main room and you can turn your video back on. Now, to join a breakout room, you need to click breakout rooms in your meeting controls. And then Diane will do a countdown to open the breakout rooms. Click join next to the breakout room you wish to participate in, then confirm by clicking join again. Uh, repeat as necessary to join other breakout rooms or click leave room to return to the main session. After the allotted time, the breakout rooms will close automatically and you will be sent back to the main room. Now, a reminder, the breakout rooms are not recorded. The chat is specific to each room. Um, and if anyone has a problem joining a breakout room, just stay behind and Diane will assign you manually. Yes, thank you, Terry. So when I um, make these breakout rooms live, it will pop up on your screen. If not, go down and click on breakout rooms. If you're on a tablet or a phone, it might be a little bit more difficult, but we can help you out. Um, so when I open these rooms, you will see the four author names and three, two, one. I am opening them. And so you should see those on your screen. There are four options. Just choose your author and you will zip through cyberspace and you will be with that author. Um, each author does have a moderator in there. So they will help you out. They will ask a few questions for you. Um, they have some questions themselves. And yeah, if anybody is left here, Terry and I are staying behind. Um, everybody else is zipping off to their room, including the authors. They are choosing which room they're going to. So it's kind of fun to see this, how everybody is, um, is zipping through cyberspace, as I say. It looks like everybody is starting to come back in. Hello. <laughs> All right. Okay, it looks like things are happening now. So, um, boy, this has just been so exciting. I want to welcome you all back to the main room. Uh, we do have our final book giveaways. So we'll just wait a little bit, make sure everybody gets back to the main room. You should be automatically coming back. And I just want to make sure... With Diane, it looks like it looks like most folks are coming in. Uh, I believe it is, but you know, Terry, I have a question for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
We all want to know about that beautiful screen on the door behind you. Can you tell us the story about that screen and where you got it? Because I think we all want it. Yes. Well, you can't have it. Um, no. <laughs> uh, it, I, I, so I work for Gertens in Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. And it's a wonderful store, lots of plants, of course, but a wonderful gift shop and all sorts of accoutrement. And I saw this and I had to have it. It's absolutely beautiful tapestry. And normally I have it hanging on the wall over here, but because that's a big door, I thought, no, and hold on just a sec. That is so beautiful. If I, let's see. It is just, I love it. I absolutely love it. So if you go to Gertens, um, and I'll give you a quick tip, look in the um, clearance rack, because sometimes you can find some really good stuff there. So anyway, welcome back, everybody. And we are so happy that uh, you were with us. And again, it's our final book giveaway. And we have two, two, Lorraine Johnson's A Northern Gardener's Guide to Native Plants and Pollinators and Noelle Johnson's Dry Climate Gardening. Diane? Sounds like I should be dry, drawing the name of a Johnson, but then it might look yeah. rude, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so first one, who, which one did you name first? Noelle? Uh, Noelle or Lorraine. Okay, so Lorraine's book is going to Penny Armstrong. So Penny, please message me, um, private message me your shipping address and do that so that I can get that to Lorraine. I got to write that down. And then for Noelle's book, we have Laura Pass. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, P-A-S. So Laura, congratulations, you get Noelle's book. And same thing, if you can private message me your shipping address, I will give that to Noelle and she can get the book out to you. So those are the two winners, the last two winners of our books for this evening. All right. Well, and, and now I thank you all for being here. And I do invite Shelly and Diane to wrap up. Well, thank you, Terry. Wow. I don't know about all of you, but this event leaves me more invigorated than ever to get out there in my spring garden and get going. So thanks for all the ideas and inspiration and for everyone gathering together. Thank you, Noelle and Jeff and Jenny, Lorraine, and to you, Terry, keep us on track. We just appreciate all that we took in and all you shared with us about gardening and your passion. As you can see, the members of GardenCom come from many different backgrounds and to learn more about garden community Educators International, we invite you to come to our website, gardencom.org. Thank you all and have a great night. I'll give it to you, Diane. Okay. Thank you, Shelly. I totally agree. I think our four authors and our moderator did an amazing job. I truly appreciate you guys explaining your goofs. Um, we've <laughs> all had them and I've had way more than my share of them, but this is what we do is we inspire each other and we learn from each other and we will be doing this again, which I think Terry has our date. Yes, I do. I'm so excited. Uh, so I, I want to make one announcement first. Diane has posted how to save the chat and save the links. So make sure you check that out uh, and also save the date for our fall 2024 book party. We'll have four new authors and we are that, oh, it's November 14th, write that down, November 14th. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us and each of our amazing, wonderful authors, Noel Johnson, Jenny Rose Carey, Jeff Rugg and Lorraine Johnson. Thank you, thank you. And with that, good night, everybody, and happy planting this spring. <laughs> good night, and thank you. Good night. 
I joined them right at COVID, October oh. 2020. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. So uh, at that time, then I just redid a lot of their learn articles and then just really got into the social media. So I take all the videos for our Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. And that's been, that's been really fun and quite a learning experience. Oh, I'm sure. How yeah. fun. That's, that's so cool. Yeah. It, so it really is fun. When I was there yesterday, I also thought Mike bought a bunch of um, zinnia seeds, the tall zinnias. Oh, So yes. that he likes, I guess his um, backyard is on a slope. I've, I've never visited there. And um, so he said he likes to have the tall flowers so that they stand up and he can see them from the deck. And mm -hmm. then I bought um, some seed starting stuff because of course I have a lot of seed. So I came home last night and I started, oh my gosh. I, I mean, I, I bought two big flats, which I don't even know. Six times 10, is that the ones? So I started a bunch of seeds today. So now I have oh boy. a pack of them. <laughs> I've got, um, I've, Got some seeds from Mary Shear. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. For the, the chili pepper. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't started them yet. It's, it's been really chaotic. A lot of things going on, but um, yeah, I, this weekend and this weekend is the Rice County Hort Day for oh. um, at uh, St. Olaf College. So oh. all oh. day. I'm excited for that. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I have to leave here like at 10 or 11 Saturday morning and drive back to Illinois. Um, I think I'm going to go join a breakout room. Somebody okay. is asking for help. So I'm okay. going to go join and see, and I'll be back. Roses here are not available in the nurseries mm -hmm. until right now. Like they're, they're just not in there in January, February. So I think, I think everybody's used to having everything in March. They are. And even some of the bare root growers from other right. parts. Of the and what people don't realize about roses, 